Evening. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. We're delighted you could join us for tonight's program on politicization of the Supreme Court. Uh, for those of you who come to a lot of programs here, you're probably wondering right now, uh, why is this guy up there? They usually have a student welcome before every program. Well, I do the welcome before this program because the students run it. It's one of our special programs that we do every year at the Dole Institute. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But I wanted to thank you all for coming out. I wanted to remind you to please, right now, take out your cell phone, turn it off so it doesn't go off. Some of you may have seen me react to cell phones going off in the middle of programs before. And it can be kind of ugly. So I want to do that. I also want to remind you of our Q&A, how we handle our questions and answers from the audience, because you'll have a chance to ask questions tonight. Uh, we will have uh, two students with cordless mics. If you have a question, please get their attention. They'll ask you if you're capable, if you can stand, to please stand, and ask just one brief question, no filibustering allowed. I want to introduce somebody who is going to be spending a lot of time at the Dole Institute this fall, our fall fellow, Ms. Nancy Boscor. Nancy? <clears throat> Nancy has some fascinating experiences. She and I have known each other longer than we care to admit, and she's done a lot of work in foreign countries and a lot of work on behalf of women, getting women uh, involved in politics and public service, and she's going to have an extraordinary discussion group this fall, and so you'll find out more about that as we, as we go into the fall. I also want to announce that tonight's program is made possible by a grant by the Ford Motor Fund. Um, one of the things that I did here when I arrived as director a few years ago is I really wanted to build a strong student culture. And so we worked very hard to do that inc incrementally over uh, my time as director of the Dole Institute. And so we have an SAB that is completely self-selected. And what that means, if you're a student at KU and you would like to be a member of our student advisory board, all you have to do is come to the meetings and volunteer and be active. You don't have to be elected. You don't have to be qualified. You don't have to fill out an application. You just come and be part of the family. And we have an extraordinary student advisory board. And we have quite a few members of our student advisory board here tonight. And I'm going to ask everybody to wave at the audience and let's give them a big hand. If you're a member of the SAB. Part of our student culture is having an SAB program every semester. The Student Advisory Board picks a subject, they select and recruit the speakers, uh, and then they run the program. They also pick the menu for the dinner for students that occurred before the uh, program. So they get to do really everything. So I love this program <clears throat> because I usually have to work at these things, so I get to sit down and enjoy hearing Miss Emily do all the work. So I'm going to introduce you to our SAB coordinator for this year. Uh, and she actually has the rare honor. She has been selected for to be the SAB coordinator for two straight years. She, I think, is the third person who's been SAB coordinator for two years. And she has done a fantastic job this year. We're looking forward. I'm going to build up your expectations a little bit. We're looking forward to a great year next year too, Emily. So we're counting on you. But it's my great honor. She's done a fantastic job for us this year. Uh, and um, I think this is gonna be a fun program. She gets to moderate it. Our SAB coordinator for this year and for next year, Emily Depew. Emily? Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. And before we begin the program and the questions, I would like to introduce our guests for tonight's program. We're joined by Lee Epstein and Stephen Ware. Lee Epstein is the Ethan A. H. Shepley Distinguished University professor, professor at Washington University in St. Louis. She is a recipient of 12 grants from the National Science Foundation and has, co has authored or co-authored more than 100 articles, essays, and books. Stephen Ware is a professor of law at the University of Kansas. He is the author of three books, 
42 law review articles, and many other publications. His writings have been cited by the Supreme Court of the United States in at least 30 other federal and state cases. So please welcome them to the Dole Institute. <laughs> Professors Ware and Epstein, could you begin by explaining the purpose of why justices are required to separate themselves from political biases? <laughs> well, I'll start by um, thanking the Dole Institute and Emily, who's done a terrific job uh, putting this together, and all the Student Advisory Board for picking such an important and interesting topic as the politics of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this particular question that Emily uh, starts us off with, which is uh, bias. Um, we don't want judges to be biased in the way we think of that expression, um, justice is blind. You've probably seen the statue who has the blindfold on and holding the scales of, of justice. Um, the idea being that the evidence on the scales is what's going to decide the case as opposed to um, is the judge going to be biased for or against one party or the other because one party is rich or poor, black or white, young or old, man or woman, Republican or Democrat, whatever. Uh, and so that's sort of political bias, like all those other kinds of bias we wouldn't want a judge to uh, have. But that's uh, a great idea of applying law to the facts of a case. However, um, that requires the judge to determine what is the law to apply to the case. And uh, often that's not so simple and easy, particularly cases that rise up in the court system to the U.S. Supreme Court level. And uh, determining what is the law often involves judges looking at uh, constitutional language, statutory language, that is not immediately clear, uh, that is uh, vague or ambiguous. And it requires uh, the judge to make judgments, uh, decisions, uh, about how to interpret or apply that law. And uh, sometimes the judge's um, uh, policy views uh, creep in to those decisions, maybe inevitably, right? Humans are humans, not uh, robots. And when given discretion, uh, sometimes human uh, preferences and judgment will come through. And the idea of judges having discretion to push the law in a more conservative direction or a more progressive direction is not some kind of new um, surprising thing. In fact, for centuries we've had the Anglo-American common law where judges make the law and it's quite open and, and uh, accepted that judges are making decisions where more conservative judges will make more conservative law and more progressive judges will make more progressive law. So the question of judges' political bias is really a very complicated and important one. I think I would only add, I, I noted in your question <coughs> that you said that we require <coughs> judges. Mm -hmm. Did you, didn't you use that word required? What was the, state the question again. Required, yes. Yes. And I think it's impossible to require judges to do anything. What, what societies try to do is set up rules that will help judges to separate themselves from politics. So the founders of our country did that by giving federal judges life tenure. So they thought if they gave federal judges life tenure, they would be above the fray of ordinary politics. Right? They wouldn't have to face the electorate to retain their jobs, and that their guiding stars would be the law, statutes, the Constitution, and precedent. Um, it doesn't always quite work that way, but I think that's how societies try to help their judges to separate by, by rules and institutions to guide judges. Historically speaking, have uh, judges uh, been, have they been successful in separating themselves from these political biases? Uh, 
It depends on the judges you're talking about. Right, so I, I think you want this program to be about the Supreme Court? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about the Supreme Court. I think in, in the Supreme Court, in many kinds of disputes, the judges do work hard to try to figure out, okay, I have to read this statute, right? And, and what does this statute mean? And how does it apply to this dispute? I think they do work hard. But what we hear about, what we read about in the newspapers, or the hot button, the salient cases, abortion, affirmative action, guns, gay rights, those are hard issues, and there's, there's not going to be one, the Constitution isn't going to provide one answer. And that's where the discretion comes in, and that's where we see the uh, effects of ideolog ideological biases, partisan biases come to play. So the cases you read about are the cases that, where partisanship and ideology come to the fore. The cases you don't read about, uh, interpreting uh, a, a section of the tax code, uh, you see much less of that. And in fact, if you think about it, on the Supreme Court today, we have one of the most liberal justices that we've had in decades. Sonia Sotomayor, and we have one of the most conservative justices we've had in decades, Clarence Thomas. And guess what? In 40% of the cases, they agree. 40% of all US Supreme Court decisions are unanimous. They're just not the ones you read about in the papers. And to add to Professor Epstein's point, this is the US Supreme Court. This is the court at the top that hears the hardest cases that lower courts have split over. Uh, these are questions about which reasonable people can disagree. Very talented judges on lower courts have typically disagreed, creating a split of authority, which is why the case gets taken by the US Supreme Court. So the uh, observation uh, Lee makes about um, progressive judges and conservative judges actually agreeing on the outcomes of lots and lots of cases that never make the news, that's even more true at the vast bulk of cases that never rise to the level of the U.S. Supreme Court. Have recent judicial confirmations furthered the politicization of the court? You know, there's, there's a couple of ways to answer that. I mean, one, one way is the court furthers the politicalization of the court, right? So when you, when you see the court take on, and they don't have to take on a lot of these issues, but when they take on abortion, they take on gun cases, they take affirmative action cases, and they're setting policy, constitutional policy for the United States, and then they divide on that policy into Democratic or Republican or liberal and conservative uh, justices, they, they look quite political, right? And so of course that's going to seep into the confirmation process because we start to think, wow, it, who we put on that court really matters. And we're putting them on for life, right? And they're gonna hear all these important cases, so that's gonna feed into the process. Yes, very true that causation runs in both directions yep. there between the confirmation process and then what the court does. And um, helpful the way Lee uh, mentions both partisan division and ideological <laughs> division as those are not always in our nation's history the same thing. We used to have lots of progressive Republicans and conservative Democrats and it's just in my lifetime that the parties have really aligned more and more ideologically so that even if we saw ideological division in the Congress and in the Supreme Court for most of our nation's history, it's just been in more recent decades that we have really seen the R and the D match up so closely with the ideological division. So now we see increasingly two teams, pretty coherent teams on these hot button cases um, where the justices are somewhat predictably ruling more and more based on the R or the D, and then that leads U.S. senators 
to more and more sort of stick with their team on the uh, votes. It was not that long ago when uh, Justice Scalia, very conservative, uh, Reagan appointee, and Justice Ginsburg, uh, much more progressive Democratic appointee, were confirmed by overwhelming bipartisan votes. And it's really just been in the last couple decades that we've seen Senate confirmation votes more and more uh, break down in partisan ways. How has the elimination of filibusters played in judicial nominations? Well, I think certainly uh, with, with, had there been a filibuster, Kavanaugh probably would not have gotten through. So and there's at least one person on the Supreme Court si since they've gotten rid of the filibuster. I, d I don't know what I think about Gorsuch. Uh, they could have filibustered Gorsuch. Uh, Gorsuch replaced Justice Scalia, so you had a pretty even trade there, a conservative for a conservative. Um, and they might not have done it, but so at least we see Kavanaugh through. The question, I think, is without the filibuster, you all know that they got rid of the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees. Without the filibuster, the question is what's going to happen in the future? And a lot of that's going to depend on whether we have a divided government in the sense of a, a president of one party and a Senate of the other. Without the filibuster, you can imagine lots of things happening. Um, you could imagine nominations piling up, right? So that the Senate would, uh, if, if uh, Donald Trump is reelected in 2020 and the Senate goes to the Democrats, you can imagine uh, vacancies on the Supreme Court, failures to confirm. On the other hand, if uh, without the filibuster, if Donald Trump were to win in 2020 and we had a Republican Senate, you can imagine um, there more Kavanaugh's and more Gorsuch's appointed very quickly to the Supreme Court without um, any opposition, which will just, as Professor Ware said, it will just perpetuate the red and the blue teams. So how the filibuster plays out down the road will depend a lot on what happens in the presidency and the Senate. And just to fill in the history a little bit on, on that, um, 60 of the 100 votes uh, to get past the filibuster in the, in the Senate. And um, I think it was 20, uh, well, it was, it was during President Obama's uh, presidency that uh, the Democratic Senate majority, Harry Reid, exercised the so-called nuclear option of getting rid of that 60-vote filibuster threshold for judges below the U.S. Supreme Court. And then uh, when uh, President Trump and a Republican majority in the Senate uh, faced uh, the, the opportunities to nominate to the Supreme Court that Professor Epstein mentioned, they extended that nuclear option to the highest court, the US Supreme Court, which allowed a uh, really very close uh, vote with, with Justice Kavanaugh and, and fairly close vote with Justice Gorsuch uh, as, as well to get, uh, get through. And it really is um, an example of a broader uh, political question that you, you see outside of our judicial nomination context of is Congress broken? Does Congress still actually work to pass legislation and do things? And when people complain about that, they often complained about, oh, gee, it takes 60 votes in the Senate. That's really hard to get anything done. So you might view uh, slim majorities passing uh, anything, including judicial confirmations, as a sign of majorities uh, working. But it's certainly a, a huge change from the not too distant past when we had overwhelming 90-something senators voting to confirm to now get down into the low 50s is really quite a contrast. So without the filibuster, you know, you're talking about a 60 rule, right, 60 person rule. Uh, without the filibuster, presidents can, I I assuming they control the Senate, can name pretty extreme people to the court if that's what they want to do. They don't need to compromise as much for the other party. And that will hold regardless of whether it's Republicans or Democrats in office. And just to give one quick example, because we just had Justice Kennedy uh, retire uh, 
recently as the swing voter on the court, the sort of the middle justice of the nine, um, back in the uh, 80s, uh, more conservative, everybody expected, uh, would have been Justice Robert Bork was nominated and, and lost uh, confirmation vote with the Democratic uh, Senate. So uh, it's an example of that divided government that Professor Epstein talked about producing a more centrist uh, nominee, ultimately making it to the court. Have presidents historically nominated judges on the way out of their term in office, such as the nomination of Merrick Garland under President Obama? <laughs> I don't, I, I may be wrong, at least in the 20th century, I don't think any president has said, well, I'm in my last year in office, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass, I'm gonna let the next guy nominate. That's never happened. So you can go back to Taft, Wilson, Hoover, FDR, uh, all made nominations, in, well at least confirmation nominations in their last year in office. Um, Johnson tried, he wasn't successful. But I don't think a president's ever said, well it's my last year so I'm not gonna do it. And it just doesn't come up that often that there's a Supreme Court vacancy in the last year of a presidency. Um, I believe prior to the um, Merrick Garland uh, 2016 example, um, the last time the issue really came to the fore was 1992 when the first President Bush was nearing the end of his first term and uh, then uh, Democratic Senator Joe Biden uh, made sort of a public statement of, of uh, might be unwise to nominate uh, Supreme Court justice during the election season, better to wait until the election plays, plays out. So it just doesn't happen that, that often. And now we are in this hyper-partisan age where it surely would be a much hotter, hotter issue. Has public perception of the court altered with it becoming more ideologically divided? Your question assumes that the court is more ideologically divided, and I don't think that's true. I think the court, again, on these very uh, salient constitutional issues, you can go back to the 1930s, the court has always divided along ideological lines. Uh, so, so I don't think that's changed. My friends who study uh, public opinion I, in, at Washington U in political science, we have one of the leading scholars in the country on this, Jim Gibson, and he tells me there really isn't a lot of movement in uh, opposition to or uh, support of the court. That Americans, if you compare at least how Americans think about the presidency and Congress, the Supreme Court enjoys much more confidence. Has the popular culture status of <clears throat> Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg contributed to the politicization of the court? Why do you ask that question? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, I, I don't, what, what, tell me, tell me what prompts that question. I guess what would prompt it is, I think that, and maybe this is just me, but in recent years I've definitely seen an increase in popular culture status of particular judges, especially Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in terms of books, movies, um, biographies. It's definitely been an increase in um, the, sal the saliency of her. Um, Notorious RBG is pretty <laughs> catchy, right? It is pretty <laughs> catchy, but you know, as I, I, I see you go back in the history of the Supreme Court, many of the justices were wallflowers. You know, you never saw, they, they went into the courtroom, the term ended, and they left. You know, they weren't out. Our justices are out and about. There is a website you can go to, it's called SCOTUS Map. And it will tell you, it, it's uh, amazing who, which justices are where. They're all over the country speaking, debating, selling books. Um, so is that a, I'm, I'm often asked that question, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I, I might throw that back out at you. If you think it's better to have our justices out there or should they be 
hidden somewhere. You know, they reach their decisions and then they go, they go hide. Worldwide, I would say that Sonia Sotomayor has an even bigger presence than Ruth Bader Ginsburg because the tremendous success of her book, My Beloved World, has been translated into many languages and, and she's a serious celebrity. So I don't know, is, is the, this sort of cult of celebrity of justices uh, politicizing the court or is it actually help legitimating the court? I do think there's growth in the celeb status of uh, justices. I'm told that back in the 70s and 80s, they would just go to the supermarket and push their cart down, fill it up with groceries, and most people wouldn't recognize who they, who they are, so they just go through life like a normal uh, average person. And then particularly Justice Ginsburg, I think there is sort of a moment here where she, she had a very successful, important career uh, advancing women's rights in the law, and I think particularly in this moment of Trump and Kavanaugh and all, for a lot of women, particularly progressive women, there's, there's, a, there's a cause for her celebrity. There's been a lot of recent conversation regarding the ethics of lifetime appointments of justices. What potential problems can this create? I don't know, if, I, I don't know about the word ethics. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means in this context. I think uh, debating life tenure is, a, is worthwhile. So I'll give you something very, very interesting. Most countries in the world, many countries in the world for their high court justices do not have life tenure. They did not follow our system. They give the justices one non-renewable term, 12 years, 15 years. And the countries that have life tenure, well, let's say uh, the United Kingdom, um, they, or Canada, it's not really life tenure. They have retirement ages. So the justices have to leave their position when they hit 70, 75. I, I, I'm not 100% sure this is true, but it's close to it. I think we are the only democracy in the world that has life tenure without a retirement age. And maybe that's worth debating. One of the problems it creates is we don't know when a justice is going to leave. So it's just like one day it happens. You know, last June, one, one day we found out Justice Kennedy was leaving the court and it was just panic and crazy and all of this rigmarole. Well, if our justices retired at 70, I believe this June we would know Clarence Thomas was leaving the bench. There would be regularized turnover, which, which I think would lower the heat on the confirmation process and, and many other aspects that we could talk about. So it might be worth having a conversation about it. And what uh, Lee says about other countries not having life tenure is also true of nearly all of our state court systems. Um, I believe Rhode Island and maybe one other state have life <coughs> tenure for their state uh, judges, but uh, every other state has either a mandatory retirement age or more likely um, re-election or reappointment of uh, judges with much shorter terms of office than the 12 or 15 years that Lee uh, mentioned. In other words, it's very common for state judges, including state Supreme Court justices around the country to have six or eight year terms and to have gotten that job by uh, election, um, sometimes partisan election, Republican versus Democrat, and then have to face an opposing candidate uh, in a, in a re-election, and this is all uh, part of the sort of grand uh, tension that's been in our uh, system from the start between uh, Hamilton and Jefferson. Uh, Hamilton, I guess we're all with the Broadway show, all Hamiltonians now. He wanted the life tenure of the independent judiciary so that the judges would have the job security to stand up and be independent, stand up to political forces whereas Jeffersonians wanted a more accountable judiciary where judges would have to sort of look over their shoulders to, to be held accountable by the voters or by political elected officials. 
And clearly our US Constitution has gone in the Hamiltonian direction of life tenure, whereas most of our state judges are much more Jeffersonian accountable uh, to, the, to the voters or somebody um, system. It also, well, it may be worth noting that most of the countries in the world have rejected the uh, Jefferson, if you want to call it the Jeffersonian system of, of, or whatever you want to call it, of elections. Very few places in the world elect their judges. It's like Bolivia, Japan, you know, it's just a handful of countries. Are there any steps that can be taken to depolarize the court? You mean depolitical? Depoliticize yes. the court? Oh, many. Here's my favorite one. If you really want to deep, here's what you do. So over time, you may not realize this, the Supreme Court has gotten nearly complete discretion to pick and choose their cases. So every year, about 6,000 parties come to the Supreme Court. They want the court to hear their cases. And the court picks 60 or 70. And really, they have complete discretion. And so they are picking hard cases. They're picking a lot of these hot button constitutional cases. Wait till next term. Next term's going to be a big one. And, and they divide over them. And they look very ideological and partisan. Here's what I do. Start taking away discretion. They got to hear 1,000 or 2,000 cases a year. They're going to look a lot more like lower courts, um, and they're, they're not going to look as political, and they're going to be much harder working. We have one of the least hard working courts in the country. So that would be, and that, that Congress could do uh, pretty easily, not, doesn't require a constitutional amendment. On those hot button uh, cases, I do think um, it would be uh, very difficult to depoliticize or reduce the ideological divisions on the court just because we do have in our society very diverse views on hot button issues that find their way into litigation. Um, and so just, but think about this. They, so let's say they have to hear a thousand cases a year and like three of them are hot button. But the other 990 or whatever are you know, pretty routine cases, and they agree. And which three will make the news? <laughs> I, I, recently, I recently read a case about uh, international arbitration. And uh, very conservative justices, Thomas uh, Scalia, were on one side of that case with very progressive justices, Kagan and Ginsburg. And then on the other side of the case, the dissenting justices was a very uh, progressive Sotomayor and a very conservative Roberts. And that is exactly the kind of 997 exactly. uh, cases. But I don't imagine uh, too many of you have read this international arbitration case I'm <laughs> talking about. Uh, and I, I think it's important to note that it's not just the social issues uh, of uh, arbitration, excuse me, of <laughs> abortion and guns. Uh, and that was a real slip, because the point I wanted to make was I read arbitration cases that are five to four ideological division cases, where the business team that was nominated by our presidents and the plaintiffs or consumers team that was nominated by D presidents line up pretty closely. And it does look like um, interest groups uh, getting their policy um, enacted by the US Supreme Court, where if we had a President Clinton and a Democratic Senate, um, your uh, arbitration agreement and your cell phone contract wouldn't be enforceable. Uh, but because we have a uh, Republican president, Republican uh, Senate, it, it is. So my point is there's just a more kind of small dollar lawyerly kind of case that shows the same ideological and partisan division that you see with the hot button social. I social think, social. I still think you swamp them. I still <laughs> think you swamp them. I think they wouldn't have the kinds of time they have now. Is there any likelihood that um, 
giving justices less discretion on the cases they choose would be implemented or possible other steps to depoliticize the court? You have to, you know, you have to understand the court has always been a, a partisan slash ideological body on these kinds of big issues. Even going back, you know, I can take my data back to the 1930s and the same kinds of ideological patterns we talk about today existed then. I do think Professor Ware makes the, the right point. The difference is we're not just seeing the ideological divisions, we see the partisan divisions. So that, that's an enormous change. You don't, it, it, it really, you don't have to go back decades. Just go back to 2010 is where the change happened. Because in 2010, we had a liberal Republican on the court, John Paul Stevens, right? And so it didn't look like the red team and the blue team. It was divided along ideological lines, but not partisan lines. Stevens leaves the court, and Elena Kagan comes on, and all of a sudden, we have the red box and we have the blue box. And this is new, a new visual. And that's, I think when you're talking about politicization, that's what I think you're talking about. Because the ideological divisions on the court are not new. The partisan division is new. I have one final question before we can go to audience Q&A. And that is that there's recently been a lot of discussion about court packing from presidential candidates. What is your perspective on this? So my perspective when I hear the phrase court packing is to think about an era that Lee has mentioned, the 1930s. Because uh, I think of the Great Depression when um, a uh, conservative, relatively conservative Supreme Court had for decades um, struck down as unconstitutional um, progressive uh, economic legislation and um, interpreting the U.S. Constitution's uh, Commerce Clause to restrict some of the economic uh, legislation that co Congress could, could enact. And Supreme Court became such an issue that Franklin Delano Roosevelt's re-election campaign in 1936, he was campaigning against the Supreme Court, the conservative justices on the Supreme Court. He was uh, criticizing them as horse and buggy uh, interpretation of the Constitution, inappropriate for this modern world with the crisis of the Great Depression, and um, had a plan to uh, expand the size of the US Supreme Court uh, so that he could uh, add new uh, progressive justices that would uh, affirm the constitutionality of the New Deal that he was uh, enacting. And, and Roosevelt and the Democrats won a huge landslide in 1936 in the Depression. And we had the famous uh, switch in time that saved nine, meaning a conservative justice or two switched from opposing the New Deal to finding it constitutional. And you have a really pretty clear example of constitutional law changing in big, big ways because of this political pressure of court packing. Um, but I think there's a, there's a really important, I mean, that's a, it's a good story on this point of court packing, but there's a really important kernel to that story, which is Roosevelt was an immensely popular president. In 1936, he wins a landslide election. He has an overwhelming majority in, in Congress, wildly popular, and yet the court packing proposal was not popular. People really were, didn't want to mess with the court. Did the court have such a deep reservoir of legitimacy, even if it went against Roosevelt, the public didn't want to uh, engage the court in that kind of political way that Ro Roosevelt did. He, he called it, you know, to help the justices. They were old and they needed help. But everybody knew what it was, right? It was, you know, to put, to put a, a, a bunch of Roosevelt appointees on the court. Um, so 
And, I mean, clearly that's the lesson for today. We have a lot of dem several Democrats talking about packing the court, but how would the public respond? I think the, the, the reservoir of, uh, of legitimacy the Supreme Court has in the public is still there. And that may not go over well. So that's, that's one of the lessons of court packing. It, it did flip the court. The threat did flip the court. But on the other hand, the public wasn't so happy. And this is maybe a hard time uh, for progressives who look at a presidential election where their candidate had more popular votes and uh, look at the U.S. House of Representatives where uh, Democrats are concentrated in big cities where they're, they're winning overwhelmingly and then closer districts going Republican and then of course the U.S. Senate uh, favors low population states that tend to be conservative and how that plays into the Electoral College, which of course produces the Supreme Court uh, that is now five to four uh, conservatives. So for progressive Democratic presidential candidates, you can really see that this is a moment where court packing has, has appeal and to that, to that audience in the primary electorate that has appeal. And part of what the U.S. Supreme Court does, this process of life tenure that we've been talking about, is that it takes the indirect democracy of we elect presidents and senators who then choose our Supreme Court justices, but with life tenure, those justices often stay on the court long after the president and senators who put them there are, are gone. To some extent, our Supreme Court reflects majorities of a decade or two or three ago. Um, and we can imagine a world uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now where the Supreme Court is much more progressive. You know, you do worry a little I, I, about the legitimacy of the Supreme Court today. When we had an Anthony Kennedy, when we had a Sandra Day O'Connor, a Lewis Powell, we had a, a middle of the court that each term, everybody could claim something. Now, there's a liberal victory, there's a conservative victory, and in a way, I think that helps the court retain its legitimacy. But what happens when you have a court that's, that, and this, this may happen, have a very extreme court, in this case, a very extreme <coughs> conservative court, with not, there's not going to be something for every, everybody each term. How does that erode the court's legitimacy or at least affect it? So it's, that's a concern. Thank you for those insights. <laughs> We're going to go to audience Q&A now. If you could ask one brief question, that would be wonderful. If you look back through history, the court appointments have not by any means always been limited to judges of inferior courts. Yes. Uh, do you see, okay, first of all, why has it changed to now where to be considered it's almost a prerequisite that you be on a district or an appellate court? And uh, why did that change and do you see it going back? I, I think that's a terrific question. We, we do only have one justice on the Supreme Court who was not a, a Court of Appeals judge, and that's Elena Kagan. Uh, she was Solicitor General, you know, kind of close, but, but it is very, very odd. Um, part, of, the, part of the story of it goes back to Eisenhower. So Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren to the Supreme Court, Earl Warren had been a governor. We can tell lots of stories about why Eisenhower appointed Warren, but Eisenhower was tremendously disappointed with Warren, um, thought he was an activist, policy-making, uh, liberal judge. In fact, when they asked Eisenhower what were his worst mistakes as president, he said one on the Supreme Court. He later said two when they're both on the Supreme Court, Brennan and Warren. 
Um, so Eisenhower got it in his head that he was going to start appointing Court of Appeals judges. And his predecessors mostly, not, not all, not all the appointments, but started to follow uh, suit. I th and, and that's turned into, as you say, almost a prerequisite for the Supreme Court. Part of it, I do believe, is now selling the candidate to the American public, selling their qualifications. And, you know, the president gets up and he says, this is Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, the Senate confirmed Brett Kavanaugh for the second highest court in the country, the D.C. Court of Appeals. He has been a great judge. And, of course, he's qualified to be on the Supreme Court. So it becomes part of the selling, and it's also a message to the Senate, you did it once before. So I think there's lots of reasons this happened. How would it change? I think probably it could change under a unified president Senate without the filibuster and uh, with an individual who has the perceived uh, qualifications um, outside of the judiciary. This exchange between uh, Mr. Fricke and Professor Epstein is a great example of how, in some sense, the Supreme Court confirmation process is less political than it used to be back in the days when a governor, uh, as opposed to some obscure appeals court judge could make it to the US Supreme Court. And Supreme Court did used to have more, I'll say, regular politicians on it, in a sense, sort of more close to the people who had you know, run for dog catcher or, or something. And now it is a much more sort of elite legal profession uh, track that puts people on the court. But as Professor Epstein said, that is in itself a form of politicization, because it's who's saleable and who has shown themselves on the Court of Appeals to vote the right way. And you have to remember, too, we're talking a lot about the Supreme Court, but the politics of confirmation has downstream to the Courts of Appeals. So uh, people like Brett Kavanaugh got their positions because they were particular kinds of people. In, in Kavanaugh's case, you know, quite conservative, worked for the right administrations. And then he gets on the Court of Appeals, and he's a, you know, on a very important court, looks like a very good judge, and he can get pushed up. I would like to see, personally, I'd like to see it change. I think that diversity of input is very important. Um, and William Rehnquist, the Chief Justice of the United States before John Roberts, spoke about this too. He had not been a federal judge. He had worked in the Nixon administration before he was uh, put on the Supreme Court. And he's, he gave several speeches bemoaning the fact that the court was becoming almost like Europe, where you get promoted up the ranks like a, a professional judiciary. And he did, not, he did not think that was a good idea. Um, how do you think that the reservoir of legitimacy will be affected by soon-to-be decisions like the census of rigging plan the, and the stonewalling of all congressional subpoenas? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, those issues are not in, in the Supreme Court right now. Uh, look. Uh, the, that's a flip answer. The, 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 the answer is, is maybe simply this. When the public perceives of the court as a political institution, the court stock goes down. And it's one of the reasons that I think Chief Justice Roberts has spoken um, about you know, these, these politicized confirmation proceedings. He's very often pointed out that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia were approved almost unanimously, as Professor Ware pointed out, and then look at Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, how close those votes are. And when you have the Supreme Court in the middle of these 
highly partisan and ideological confirmation proceedings, their legitimacy goes down. So when they, if they get involved in all of the, the battle between the president and the House of Representatives, it, it puts them squarely in, in, in partisan de debates. And that, that's not great for their legitimacy. And I think this question just perfectly illustrates a uh, topic we mentioned a uh, bigger picture earlier, which is the, the questioner's examples were what was in today's headlines in the news. And those are things likely to rise up in the court system, much as uh, last week's headlines and next week's headlines. The, the big news stories of the day in our society so often make it up to the US Supreme Court that if we have a politically divided, ideologically divided country, it's not surprising that we're going to see the court divide similarly. You know, you can think about the di so think about the difference. Some of you in the room will remember the Nixon Watergate tapes case, which gets to the Supreme Court. You know, there's a big thing. Uh, everybody wants the tapes. Does Nixon have to give up the tapes? And the court, eight to zero votes against Nixon, including three of his appointees. And you know, what does the court look like there? It looks like a legal body. It can reach a unanimous decision on one of the most highly salient political issues of the times. Flash forward to 2000 and think about Bush versus Gore where the court divides the liberals on one side, the conservatives on the other, to essentially give the, the election uh, to Bush the second. The court looks like a partisan, political, ideological body. So a lot of it's in the control of the court. If it's important that we have all of our judges, and I'm, I'm referring not only to just the Supreme Court judges, but all of our judges. If it's important for them to be non-biased and or non-political, why then would it not be better to have them be appointed by a multiple bipartisan committee, whether it's a congressional committee or some other committee, rather than a singular political president? There's a, it's a very good question. And there's a very interesting new book about this where the authors compare court systems in the United States, the UK, Australia, Canada, uh, maybe India as well. And, and we all use very different systems in selecting our judges. They, the authors characterize our system as the most political because we have both elected branches of government involved in the process. And they say that that leads to a political court, where you look at something like the UK, which has a sort of version of what you're talking about, and the UK Supreme Court doesn't look as political, uh, partisan-wise or ideological. Uh, and, and many countries have gone to kind of a, a merit system that you see in some of the states. Um, whether this would hold in the United States, a lot of it is who picks the people on the commissions and, and so on and so forth. But there does seem to be a link between having political actors involved in the selection of judges and the end result being political judges. And Professor Epstein's point about um, nonpartisan or merit uh, sounds good uh, at first, but then she asks, who picks the pickers? Who picks the commission? Um, if there's a lot at stake in the decisions that the court is going to make, we can count on interest groups who see those stakes to invest heavily in getting in on picking the pickers. And it seems to me that if you're going to have political or ideological uh, groups uh, caring about the outcome of cases, and so the selection process is inevitably political in that sense, I'd much rather have the politics out in the open, 
where there's sunshine and journalists and citizens can see, see it in a Senate confirmation vote and then hold senators accountable at election time than have the politics behind closed doors? I'm not sure that you can analogize what countries like the UK uh, and others have done to the merit selection panels within the states. They're actually quite different setups, but the point is, is well taken. I'm still really intrigued by the research, though, because it strikes me as intuitively right. You have elected political actors picking judges. They're going to be motivated to pick judges who are a lot like them. I always say to my students, if the president could clone himself and put himself on the court, that's what all presidents would do, right? Um, and, and so the idea of moving to the kinds of systems to which you referred, um, we would have need constitutional amendment, we'd have to change the whole system, uh, but it is an intriguing one for me, having read some of the research. So I have like a two-phase question. So the first part is, what do you think is the main reason why um, criminal justice reform has not been passed? And then the second phase would be, uh, if, you believe it, if you believe it's possible to get it done, what would be the most bipartisan alternative? Not my area at all. <laughs> I don't know if you have the thought. No, I'm sorry, I just don't. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, you mentioned that the thing that we usually hear about are the hot button social issues that come before the court. Are, have there been any recent examples of cases that you think the American public has missed the significance of um, that the Supreme Court has heard or anything that's coming up that's important? You know, there's this, you, you probably have an, you, in your field, you have an answer. One of the things that I've heard from journalists is they're having a very hard time uh, capturing a, a very important set of cases dealing with administrative agencies. And it, it, the basic issue is how much courts should give deference to the decisions of administrative agencies. And people like hear the word administrative agency and they go to sleep, right? They're like completely bored. But the administrative agencies, of course, do an enormous amount of policy making in, in, in the United States. And the degree to which courts defer to their decisions or, the, or not defer is a really, really big issue. And there's some cases in the Supreme Court that, that deal with this. And I think, again, I think the journalists are having a hard time trying to convey to people, this is really big stuff. Pay attention. And it goes under the radar. And inevitably, we're going to see some partisan and ideological splits in those cases. So that's one area, I would say. You, you probably have some, too. That's a terrific e example. Um, if you ever want to scare everybody away from you at a cocktail party, just say Chevron deference. Right. And there'll be like two administrative lawyers really fired up to talk about Chevron deference. And, and, it's, it's a nerdy, obscure topic, but it's what makes that um, phenomenon that Professor Epstein mentioned earlier of the second most important court in the country is the DC Circuit, uh, because that's the one that hears these cases. And we've talked about how the US Supreme Court only hears a small number of cases, so the uh, Court of Appeals is the final word in many, many cases. And it's the DC Court of Appeals that's the final word in many of these administrative deference um, ca cases. And you name any area of law, whether it be environmental law or securities law, administrative agency is a huge lawmaker. And DC Circuit Court of Appeals looking over its shoulder is a check on that bureaucratic lawmaker. I think we have time for one final question, if anyone has a question. <laughs>
questioning what you would historically consider to be the worst decisions that the Supreme Court has ever made. <laughs> I think the easy answer is Plessy v. Ferguson or Korematsu. Yeah, they, they generally top almost everybody's list. I think with that, er, er, we may have, with that being such a short answer, we do have time for one more question. <laughs> it would be more controversial to ask what are the best. <laughs> you know, when Supreme Court nominees um, go before the Senate, there's always a, a couple of decisions they have to say are very, very bad, right? And that would be Korematsu, which by the way, the Supreme, this Korematsu, you know, is the case uh, of the Japanese, uh, internment of Japanese Americans. Um, by the way, the court just overruled that last year, right? Last year, they finally overruled it. But um, they, you, you can't like Korematsu, of course, Plessy. And then there are the cases that the nominees praise, right? What are those cases? Brown. Brown, uh, uh, Marbury versus Madison, Judicial Review. There's a certain, you know, on the, this, is, this is on the, the good list, and this is on the bad list. So some of the papers I've read, they talk about this pattern of judges really discounting some of the research from social science that comes forward in the court. Do you think that this adds to the polarization or do you think they should look at the research that's being presented? Well, we have a social scientist here and Professor uh, Epstein, but I will just say as a lawyer that there's uh, lots of us lawyers who are not capable of doing regression analysis or assessing uh, social science research very well? You know, I have to say, though, there was a report, uh, I read a couple of reports on, uh, on the, the census case that was argued a few days ago, and uh, I, I admit I have not read the transcripts yet of oral argument, but in the, in the newspaper reports, it, it said that Justice, Scalia, uh, Justice Alito at one point said, you know, the statistics, it's just it's so technical and complicated. Come on. <laughs> you got to decide this case. You're really, really smart. You have four brainiac law clerks. You've got a ton of briefs. This is, if this is important for the case, you need to understand it. And so I find a little bit, sometimes when I hear the Chief Justice once referred to some uh, social science thing as sociological gobbledygook, right? And sometimes I think it's just sort of a quaint little act that they do. Uh, but I, I, I do think they don't have to understand every aspect of the data in every case. A lot of times it's not that relevant, but it's when it's relevant, you know what? You gotta understand it. It's part of deciding the case. So I find, a little, uh, I, I'm a, find it a little bit appalling, honestly. And on that note, well, <laughs> <laughs> If we could give Professors Epstein and Ware a round of applause for joining Thank us you. tonight. Thank you for all coming out.